Thanks for joining us this week at Garden City. If you want to contribute to what Garden City is doing, there's three ways that you can help us. You can like this video and subscribe to the channel. You can share this video with a friend, or you can give online at gardencitynw.com slash give. So we got this rope swing. I tied it up to our apple tree and we thought the kids would love it. And, and they did, they just loved it too much and didn't want to share it. So I, we walked out uh, to the sounds that we thought were going to be of joy and laughter and they were fighting. I mean, throwing bows, they were so mad at each other. And uh, I have a seven-year-old and an almost three-year-old and uh, they were so mad. I kind of broke my, I said, what's going on? And what's with you two? Come on, we got you this toy. This is so you guys will have fun, have fun. And uh, and they were mad at each other. She stole it and he wouldn't let me have a turn. And I said, hey, we forgive each other. We're Bedlians. We have to forgive. We have to work this out. So would you would you ask for forgiveness? And so they did. And uh, my daughter's like, would you forgive me, Wesley? And Wesley's like, yes. Will you forgive me, Lella? And uh, my daughter, Novella, says, I'm not forgiving him, Dad. He doesn't really mean it. <laughs> and isn't that like, isn't that so true? I mean, beyond just children, forgiveness is hard. I mean, I was even driving here to give this talk, to do this sermon, and I'm thinking through my sermon, and like all of a sudden someone cuts me off. Like, I mean, I had to like hit the brakes. They almost hit me off, and I was just like immediately like, Arr! you know, and, and I'm like, oh, I'm teaching on forgiveness. That's why this is happening. And uh, forgiveness is tough, you know, with family, especially family friends, people you don't know. And um, we've been in the middle of this story uh, about Jesus, the power of Jesus and the power of friendship. And uh, these, these four men have taken their paralyzed friend. They've, they've carried him uh, through a crowd. They broke through uh, the roof, probably was Jesus' own personal home, and broke through the roof and laid their friend down at Jesus' feet just for the chance that he might be healed just for the chance. And uh, we enter this story at that, at that point where Jesus sees him being lowered and he res- Jesus responds in compassion and love. In verse 5, it says this, Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends, not, not the paraplegic, but the faith of the friends. And he said this to the, to the paralyzed man, child, your sins are forgiven. Well, they were bringing their friend to Jesus to be healed, like to be physically healed. Forgiveness is nice, Jesus, but like we want him to be healed. But Jesus starts with forgiveness. Isn't that so interesting? And then immediately the religious people in the crowd, legal experts, the religious law, they start saying in verse 6, how dare this fellow speak like this? How dare he say something like this? Uh, they grumbled some of the illegal experts among themselves. Verse 7, it's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins except God? Like, how dare he? It's, this is like a, someone from the Pacific Northwest going to Starbucks, getting their order, and getting their, their coffee and being like, how dare you? I said, no foam! You know, a huge insult. Um, so interesting sometimes when we, we can get caught up in religion over relationship. I don't know if you've ever had that in your life. It has in mine. But I've noticed that even like um, with Whitewater, we say you can belong before you believe. Maybe you've noticed that. And I've had people who have been very religious for a long time get very upset by that statement. What do you mean they can belong before they believe? They have to believe first. They have to change first. They have to know Jesus. They have to, they have to sign up, uh, you know, on the dotted line. They have to agree with all of what we, what we think, uh, theologically for them to belong. And which is really, I mean, it makes sense systematically and from a human perspective. And until you compare it to the way of Jesus. Jesus was always with sinners. He never made uh, his disciples or sinners who are around him, tax collectors and all kinds of people. He never made them change and repent before he was willing to build a relationship with them. He didn't always agree with them, but he accepted them. So we believe you can belong before you believe. And, and sometimes uh, you got to ruffle religious feathers a little bit if you follow the way of Jesus. Now, this is interesting. If we keep going here, uh, what, like the question is, why are they so upset? What does blasphemy mean? Well, they're, they're saying you're insulting God when they use the word blasphemy. And um, the reason they thought that, the reason they were so upset is because uh, only the priests 
could declare forgiveness in their culture, in their um, expressions of faith. Only the priest could forgive at the temple. So it had to be at a certain place with a certain person so that you could receive forgiveness. If the paralyzed man needed forgiveness, he should have been taken to the temple, not to the wandering preacher Jesus. Why did you take him here? So they're kind of mad at these guys. Like, is he, if he needs forgiveness, he should be taken to the temple. He should be taken to a priest, not to this guy. If he needs healing, he should go seek God at the temple, not with this guy. They don't see who's in front of them. They don't, let, they don't know yet that Jesus is the Son of God. They're curious, interested, but skeptical, and they're offended. Verse 8, Jesus knew at once in his spirit that thoughts like these were in the air. You ever known that like at a family gathering, like, oh, this person's really upset, or someone says something a little off color, and that made these people really mad? You can kind of sense it. This goes on to say in verse 8, Jesus knew at once in his spirit that thoughts like this were in the air. Why do your hearts tell you to think that? He doesn't just start with their head. He starts with their hearts. He's like, why does your core being look at what's wrong? Look at this amazing moment where this, these, these men who love this man are, are having this act of compassion and faith. Why do you immediately jump to what you don't like and what's wrong? He asks, answer me this, Jesus says to the, the religious leaders. He went on, is it easier to say to this crippled man, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk? Which is easier? Which is more difficult? He's kind of getting at the reality that like a lot of spiritual things you can't see, like this forgiveness moment that happens, like it meant something, it was powerful, but like you, you can't prove it like in a scientific lab. You know, that's why it's so funny when people are like, well, faith, you know, is is opposed to science and they and, and faith doesn't make sense and you can't prove faith. And it's like, well, the most important things you can't prove, forgiveness, love, hope. I mean, you can see the results of those things, but you can't like test it in a lab. And here Jesus is saying, okay, what's what's harder to do? Something you can physically see, like where, where I manipulate the molecular structure of this man somehow, or I forgive him, which is more difficult to you, which are you more offended by? Jesus says this in verse 10, you want to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? This is kind of like a bonus. In Mark 14 and in the book of Daniel, um, there's this term, the Son of Man that's used. And it really is a way of talking about the Son of God. I'll let you do some research on your own on that. But Jesus says, you want to know that the Son of Man, you want to know that I can forgive sins? You want to know if that's true, of whether I should be able to do that or not, or whether it needs to happen in a temple? somewhere. Watch this. Just so you know that I am the Son of God and have the ability to forgive, he turns to the paraplegic and he says, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, your stretcher, and go home. Walk home. He got up, he picked up the stretcher in a flash and went before them all. Everyone was astonished, and they praised God. We've never seen anything like this, they said. Now, this story is unbelievable. There's a few um, scriptural, cultural things I want to point out, and then I want to get to the heart of this message. The first thing is Jesus verifies his authority as the Son of God to forgive by healing this man can't see the results of forgiveness right away most of the time. Sometimes you can. You can't see it's an inward work that happens spiritually. But you can see if someone who couldn't walk could all of a sudden walk again. And so Jesus proves his divinity, his um, authority as the Son of God to forgive by just looking over and changing that man's structure, like physically, like molecules were changed in this man, like He walked, he got up, and he walked out of there. And the man walking up out of that room was the evidence of Jesus' power to forgive. And this is a foreshadowing of the cross. Jesus forgives the whole world when he dies on the cross for humanity. I mean, he came to teach us the way of forgiveness. He forgives the whole world. And then three days later, he gets up out of the tomb and walks out. Him, when Jesus got up out of the tomb and walked out, it was his proof 
that he was the forgiver of sins for the whole world. Jesus is the Son of God with power to forgive, with power to free, and to heal all that needs healing in our world. Desmond Tutu said this powerful statement, there is no future without forgiveness. See, Jesus lived in this culture, and Mark, the author of the book that we're studying, he's trying to immerse us in his world. And his worldview is like, we are living in a world that is based on a culture of revenge and retribution. Um, There's a term called retributive justice. Um, And it's 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 a academic term for a culture built on getting revenge and getting retribution. So it's a punishment culture. It's an eye for an eye culture. It's hate for hate. And when you're living in a culture that's revenge oriented, like you just keep recycling revenge over. You hurt this person, hurt that person's eye, they hurt your eye. You punch this person in the face, they punch you in the face. It's all like it's getting even. And uh, Jesus shows us this different way. Rather than recycle revenge in the world and violence, anger, and pain, We retire it. We extinguish it. There's no better example of this than when Jesus absorbed and extinguished evil on the cross and and converted evil, converted wrath and anger and wrong into forgiveness, love, mercy, grace, truth. It's amazing what Jesus did. And here's something that's really, really important. We are either transmitting our pain and anger or we are transforming it. We're either transmitting our anger, our frustration, our, our thoughts of revenge, our actions of revenge and wrath, or we are transforming those things to something better, to something greater, to something good. And revenge and anger and pain, uh, those get, those get um, transmitted like a, like a disease from host to host. And the only way to put that out of the system or out of our world and out of our life is through radical forgiveness. Jesus shows us how to walk that path forward. You cannot extinguish and transform pain, anger, resentment, bitterness, thoughts and habitual thoughts of revenge without radical forgiveness. Jesus not only forgives, he demonstrates and teaches how we are to be people of forgiveness. If you become a Christian, you have to learn how to forgive. Some people, it makes them really angry. I don't want to learn how to forgive. I'll receive forgiveness. I don't want to give forgiveness. (laughs) You ever felt that way? Like my daughter, I don't want to forgive him. He doesn't really mean it. She's saying he doesn't deserve it yet. And uh, Jesus forgives even when we don't deserve. He demonstrates the transformative power of forgiveness. Forgiveness transforms the situation. Jesus cried out on the cross as he was dying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus came to forgive. There's no future without forgiveness. Now, we see uh, in, I think, revenge culture, you see things like cancel culture, where you cancel people, you cut them out of your life. You know, whether it's, you know, digitally cutting them off on social media or family members, I'm never speaking to them again. We, um, we find ways of excluding, cutting them out, um, shunning, you know, as uh, Dwight Schrute would do. Shun and then unshun and then reshun, you know, like that's revenge culture. That's retribution. That's cancel culture. But here's the thing. Did you know that the word Pharisee means to separate or cut off? We become Pharisees when we cancel others. And also, Jesus shows us with his life and his teachings, when we cancel others, we cancel ourselves. Judge not, lest ye be judged. It's an old saying in the Bible. Jesus taught that. Like, you're going to be judged the way you judge other people. If you cut other people off, you're gonna, that's going to happen to you. That's just the, that you, you're, you're recycling anger, pain, rage, violence. We need to extinguish it. We need to transform it. I love this quote from N.T. Wright. He says, Sometimes whole nations, governments engage in childish but deadly evil for evil retaliations. People who live that way tend to think God lives that way too. And we think like, oh, God, he wants to get revenge. He wants retribution. 
Uh, God's looking to smite me, and he's, he's wanting to get this for that. He loves it when people are at odds with each other. And it's just such, that's not who God is. God is the best picture of God. If you want to know what God looks like, you look to Jesus. And there's nothing better as a picture of God's heart than Jesus absorbing evil and transforming it into your good and my good. And if we want to follow in the way of Jesus, we want to follow someone who in the moment where these men lower a guy who's broken and needs healing, brings forgiveness that leads to healing, and then he also offers grace to his enemies, the Pharisees. We want to be like that. Restoration requires radical forgiveness. It requires radical forgiveness. See, forgiveness isn't fair. Forgiveness is freedom. It's not fair. Sometimes they don't deserve it. Sometimes the person who's hurt you, like they, they're so offensive. They don't, they're so blind and what they said, what they wrote, what they did, what they didn't do, how they, how they didn't show up or how they betrayed you. Like it doesn't deserve forgiveness. There is no future without forgiveness. There's no future. Jesus knew this. Uh, people who follow Jesus, they who really know him, know the Father's heart, know that we take the way of forgiveness. And that way we reflect the, God's restoration to a broken world. In 1994, um, there was a, a, a country that was suffering a buildup of retribution and revenge and hatred between people groups. And it was the Hutu tribe versus the Tutsi tribe in Rwanda. And in 1994, in a matter of 100 days, about a million people were murdered. Total genocide. Um, people didn't know what to do. Authorities uh, didn't know what to do and, and allowed this thing to happen. And this cultural anger and retribution bubbled up. And it was so ugly. Um, and just so you know, a, a million people in Rwanda is 10% of the population. When the leaders faced this, this almost impossible situation and problem, how do you bring a country back together and heal? They chose the way of truth and reconciliation. They brought the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, and they actually decided to put um, trials and tribunals on the village level not just the state level, the village level. So villages were empowered, small, big villages to the tiniest village you can imagine were empowered to make decisions so that they could bring healing and forgiveness in um, villages where you had neighbors who betrayed each other, murdered each other, families who were decimated, part of the same, some of them even same families because they had been intermarried. And um, I'll never forget a friend in Rwanda telling me um, about his country, and he said there was one, one story in particular he remembers where uh, at, a, at a village, a woman stepped out into the middle of the village for a, one of these trials, and the perpetrator, uh, her neighbor, who had murdered her family, stepped out. And she was allowed to ask anything she wanted, and this man had to admit the truth for his sentence to be mitigated. If he didn't admit the truth, there was no mitigation. And the woman just started asking questions. Did you kill my family? Yes. How? Um, I killed them with a garden tool. She says, how? Show me. And he shows her how he killed her children and her husband, how he hit them. She says, where did you bury them? Buried them over here. Why did you kill my family? We were friends. We were neighbors. Our children were growing up together. He said, the state said if I didn't, they would come after my family. That's no excuse. We were friends. And just, you know, tears, anger. And this man looking at this woman after sharing and answering all her questions, he asked, would you forgive me? And what for probably seemed like an eternity, she stood there. And then she said, I choose to forgive. I don't know if I could do that. In our culture right now, where some people are so angry at each other and have cut each other off and canceled each other from, 
from our lives. In this country, forgiveness began repairing wounds that like were losses that could never be given back. That woman would never see her children again this side of heaven, her husband again this side of heaven. She chose to forgive. There is no future without forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't always fair, but forgiveness frees. If you forgive, you, there's something you have to absorb that won't be fair. And it's, it's, you're gonna absorb pain, you're gonna absorb hurt. But I'm telling you, you won't keep recycling this poison that will poison you, it'll poison others. You're gonna take it out of the system, you're gonna pull it out. And, you, and when forgiveness starts, healing starts. In the picture Mark is giving of these men who rip a hole in Jesus' ceiling, in his world as he's preaching, to lower a man down for forgiveness and healing is a foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus. That, that when Jesus died on the cross, he was rupturing a hole in our reality. He was ripping a hole through the ceiling of our world, um, letting the light of forgiveness and freedom and healing come beaming in. Let me ask you this, has Jesus broken into your world so that you can receive his forgiveness? What do you need forgiveness for in your life? Where do you need God's grace? The cross of Jesus breaks into our world and it gives us a new path forward so that we don't have to choose the way of canceling and cutting people out of our life. We can help restore them um, we don't just transmit our pain and our anger uh, and keep that as this sickness with people. We actually can transform our pain in our anger in Jesus because there is no future without forgiveness.